we're live. So have you ever been stuck somewhere that you don't want to be, but you can't get back because of your medical concerns? I know that a lot of my clients, like a lot of my clients, they, they travel. I live in Montreal. And so tons of my clients go to Florida for the winter. And believe me, I wish I was in Florida right now. And my guest, I think he's in Miami, making me very jealous. <laughs> um, but a lot of my clients go to Florida for the winter. And often because they're older adults, they have some sort of a medical crisis. And now they're supposed to be flying back and families worried about them. How do they get back? Um, they shouldn't be alone on the flight. There needs to be more help or even worse, there is like a serious medical crisis and they can't even get on a regular plane, a commercial airplane and need some other kind of transport. So I'm really excited to have Sean Bryan on today because he is going to tell us all about the ins and outs of the medical transporting world. Um, hi, Sean. Hi. Good morning and thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, so let me just give a bit of background information about who you are. Sean is the Assistant Director of Medical Operations at Riva Inc., one of the largest fixed wing air ambulance companies in the world. Uh, he, prior to being in this field, he was in the ER trauma department at hospitals. So the guy probably is really good in a crisis, I would hope. Uh, he also has a degree in nursing. He has his MBA in healthcare management, and he's also a member of the Air Surface Transport Nurses Association, which I had no idea existed until <laughs> about two days ago. <laughs> so Sean, my, um, my OBGYN, was a flight surgeon in the military. And then he, you know, he's a physician, he was a flight surgeon, and then he went into OBGYN um, after I guess he was done serving in the military. I love this guy. He was so calm. And I was so happy to have him because I was thinking this, he's probably like MacGyver. He can probably figure anything out with whatever equipment and stuff he has. Because when you're up in the air and something is happening, I mean, you guys, I'm sure you're very equipped, but you have to really be on your toes, huh? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And to feel that sense of comfort and that MacGyver is, I guess that's a great way to put it. Um, there's going to be no one probably calmer in any type of situation than a flight surgeon or a trauma surgeon, especially those with military background who are specifically trained for that because it's not for everyone. So on your feet, yes, it's it's kind of mandatory in this line of business because we, you know, in most cases we're at 40,000 feet with no phone and no additional help. So we have to be the best of the best at all times. And there's really no time for error or time to sit there and let it pass. So. Yeah. And you have to, obviously you need to stay calm. So you're thinking clearly, but then you also have to project calmness too, which, you know, I imagine sometimes the heart's pounding, but on the outside, you're like looking all zen. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where the training comes into play. Um, and it, to become a flight nurse or to get into these types of scenarios, you have to have an extensive background in, let's say, ER, trauma, uh, critical care medicine, uh, in very strong ICUs throughout the United States or wherever. Um, and when you onboard from there, you go through an extensive training program. Uh, and it actually takes sometimes a couple weeks, a couple months to actually be signed off to fly on your own with a team. Uh, because as a nurse, for instance, as a nurse, when you come on board as a flight nurse, you're kind of operating outside of that typical scope of practice that we're used to in the hospital. Uh, things that you, you would phone the doctor for or ask is just something that's automatic to you as a flight nurse. Yeah, so I'm sure like the, the range of skills all of you nurses have that are up in the air are are very broad and, and outside the scope, I'm sure. Um, let me understand a bit like what got you into the world of trauma and crises? I mean, I'm I, although I guess as a social worker, everyone who calls me is in crisis too, <laughs> um, but it's, it's definitely different. It's not life or death situations. Like what got you into that? Were you a, a kid who like, when someone fell off their bike, you loved running, you were the first one there trying to help them? Is it like in your <laughs> DNA? <laughs> well, uh, honestly, I, I am a military child. So uh, my father growing up was a corpsman. So he was a medic with the United States Marine Corps and Navy for the first 18 years of my life. Um, so you kind of had this love for it. I have an abundance of aunts that were all critical care nurses. 
Uh, so you kind of just kind of got to see that picture. Um, when I started in nursing school, it was quite evident to me right off the bat that I did not want to be on the floor. I did not want to, I just, I, I guess when you're an ER nurse, I don't want to do the other stuff. I want to do the critical stuff. So I knew right from the get go that immediately I wanted to deal with ER trauma. It was fast pace. It was different. It was exciting. Um, and it was never the same thing over and over again. Uh, and that's, that's really what led me to it. And I, I'm a very fast paced person. I'm very, I can be easily bored with something. So I like the new and I like the excitement. So that's how I, I ended up into ER trauma. And I started in Pittsburgh at UPMC, which was an amazing place to train. Uh, it's one of the Mecca hospital systems in this country. Uh, so getting a taste of that was amazing. And then I began as a travel nurse uh, because I was young and single and wanted to kind of spread my wings and see what ERs and trauma centers were like in different areas of the country, which led me down to Miami and Fort Lauderdale area, which opened up my eyes even more uh, because it was just a whole different world down here with all the different uh, cultures, diversity. Uh, my first hospital I worked at down here was Spanish speaking first and I didn't speak a lick of Spanish. So it was really just kind of exciting. Um, and that ER trauma, was just at a different level down here in South Florida. Um, but then I kind of ventured out. I always had this goal of wanting to be on a helicopter. Hmm. When I first graduated and got to the ER, it was, I want to be that guy in the flight suit that walks through the ER with, you know, the angel in the sky and <laughs> I'm going to save your life. Um, that your was ego, all we knew. Your ego was leading the way there. Yes, huh? yes, it was. And, <laughs> And I thought I was ready at 22 with no experience, and I definitely wasn't. Um, but I, you know, when you're ER trauma, you kind of look at those guys and gals, and you're just like, I want to do that. But I started to do my research, and I realized that there was this whole other area of flight nursing out there and air medicine that people don't often talk about. Uh, very rarely, unless you're in the field or in the niche or a caseworker. Um, and I came across Reva because Reva is huge and we're a very large company and um, realized, huh, that kind of looks cool. They have 20 fixed wing Learjets. That sounds a lot more cool than flying in a helicopter. And it sounds pretty cool that on a daily basis, they fly not just in the country, but primarily 90% of our business is international back to the States or Canada or Europe. So that's yeah. really how I got into it. And then tell me, like you guys are in some interesting situations. I know there's all different levels of services that you guys provide, and I want to get to all of that. But, you know, coincidentally, you almost weren't able to make our scheduled talk today because something came up and which is like right in your right. wheelhouse. You love that. Ooh, change of pace, crisis, something's happening, right. the unpredictable. Um, talk to me what that situation was and then like how your company is implicated and how you help somebody. So you caught me this week when I told you I had a free week. Um, well, we, we ended up having a very high level case on the other side of the world, literally. Um, normally things would be a little bit smoother, but due to the times now with COVID, yeah. things are a lot more difficult, even with a medevac, pulling our medevac card, getting into different places. So things such as obtaining permits in countries, um, medical parole, getting the doctors at these facilities to approve transfer, dealing with CBP. What's CBP? Um, so Customs and Border Patrol. So okay, getting someone back in the United States, very difficult okay. uh, because uh, with the COVID, even if they are negative or positive or confirmed, it's still very cautious, even though we're a year into it here in the States and we have a very good understanding of how to transport it safely. It's still a very hot, hot item. And now that we have restrictions in the United States, that no one can enter the United States of America without a test within 72 hours. Kind of a hiccup when we're in isolated locations that may not even have testing available. Um, so I was relocated and we were on our way to go pick up this patient and midway through the flight. Unfortunately, we found out it was pretty much not gonna happen for the next 72 hours. And that the permits we were planning to get would not happen uh, due to a mixture of COVID, a uh, holiday in, the, um, in that culture that they celebrate that actually goes for the whole weekend. And essentially the Ministry of Health and whatnot said we had to pump the brakes and wait. 
So there was really no sense in relocating airplanes all over the world to not yeah. be able to get the patient. And what, what are the different medical crises? Because you mentioned medevac, and I know there's air ambulance, there's medevac, and then you mentioned something else right before we went live, commercial medical escorts. So tell me about what the different crises are that you're called in to respond, to go pick up a patient. Like what are the illnesses, situations, and which of these would respond? Okay, so we'll start with our bread and butter. And our bread and butter and biggest thing that we do is true air ambulance. So a true air, air ambulance with fixed wing is, we have we have roughly 15, 16 Lear jets. Every single jet is was once a charter, and then we take it and we completely rip everything out and we convert it into a flying ICU ambulance. Hmm. So there's a beautiful stretcher in the side, there's seats, and a bench in the back for family members. We also have, and with that, with that air ambulance, we have the capabilities to pretty much run an ICU at 40,000 feet. Oh my God. For hours amazing. at a time. Uh, so we can actually transport just about anything in this ambulance. And we so what kind of- We ECMO, cardiac arrest, strokes. I mean, daily we're doing traumas and cardiac, trauma and cardiac are our two most common things that we do. So trauma, you're talking about like car accidents and things like this? So it's a different type of trauma. So in the fixed wing world, a lot of our flights, our flights are, I guess you could say scheduled because it's not like uh, it's not like a trauma hawk or the helicopters we see flying who are, they're rolling up fresh on a scene. So someone gets in a car accident on the highway and that they decided they need to do an air medevac with a helicopter. Okay, so they're that's gonna what receive medevac the traumas is. like that. Yes. Okay, okay. Yes. Whereas we will be getting the call after someone has had a trauma. Let's say, let's say someone was on a cruise and they were on an excursion in Jamaica or something like that. And on that excursion, something happened and there was an injury or a car accident. That person's going to be taken to the nearest local hospital in that country, whatever it is. The next thing that's going to happen is, is that person or individual, if they realize that they're going to, you know, need to be admitted into that hospital for an extended period of time, they're going to be reaching out and looking for a way to get back to Canada, the United States. Uh, so they'll reach out to their travel insurance or their travel assistance or their own health insurance and see what type of options there is to get them out of there and how fast. So when we wrote, when we come across a trauma, that trauma has already been somewhat stabilized and just needs to be transported back to the States or Canada for either a higher level of care or just care in general because they just can't afford to keep paying cash out of pocket in another country for healthcare when they have it covered in their own country. So. Okay, so, wow. Yeah, and I remember when a friend of mine had a collapsed lung, I think, in um, Mexico. And I mean, she was you know, in the hospital. Unfortunately, she speaks a bit of Spanish but we talked about it after. I mean, it must be incredibly frightening to be in a foreign country, especially if you don't speak the language, wondering, you know, what's going on? What kind of treatment I'm getting? I know for myself, I'd be like, get get me home for sure. I'd right. want to get home. Now, so those are like air ambulances. So someone has a, a trauma there somewhere. Um, they had, they were stabilized and now they want to return home. And it's basically like an ICU in the air. You said that families can go. So you can, like when you call insurance and say, my husband has been injured, he needs to get back to Montreal. How many family members can go with my husband, let's say, could my whole family go? How does that work? So depending on the size of the aircraft and depending on how sick or injured your husband would be. So in our typical aircraft, we have room sometimes for two or three family members. Okay. Depending on the situation. However, if, if it is a very critical condition, then we have to add a different configuration of team members. So we would typically, our typical configuration is a nurse and a paramedic, most commonly seen team. So you always um, have at least two Always two critical on. members. Always okay. a nurse and an either a paramedic or a respiratory therapist. But we also have an entire bucket of flight physicians throughout the country that we utilize as well. Hmm. And we utilize these flight physicians in when there's kind of situations that are where there's a lot of uncertainty uh, or the client who's paying for the flight would like a flight physician on board as well. So that would be a three-man team. If we had a three-man team, we would still be able to fit the patient 
and one or two family members on wow. board. And we do everything we can because you hit the you hit it right on the dot of how scary it is. You know, you when you go on vacation, it's supposed to be a happy time. It's supposed to be the best time. You've been waiting all year to go away, and then boom, something happens. Like dad has a stroke, and then you're you're then in a foreign hospital. You don't speak the the language. You don't know what's going on. And it's just scary. So we do everything in our power. And I know many companies like us also will transport a family member as well, just as a, a level of comfort and, and that sense of like security. Because when we walk through the door in these hospitals, uh, we're met with a giant hug. It's one of the most rewarding jobs in healthcare I can, I've been a part of. Um, and when I talk to nurses around the you know, around the entire country, I tell them that that when when you work at our in our industry, you walk in a door and you're getting hugged by family members who are oh, just yeah. they just want to come home. So we do try to accommodate as much as possible. We try to help the families out and get them back on the plane with them. And how much different equipment and and stuff do you have? I mean, like you could need all sorts of different medications, all sorts of different equipment. I mean, you basically do you load different stuff based on what the presenting illness or trauma is, or it's just always standard that you have this, you know, all of these medications, et cetera. So every single flight, we have the same bag set. So if you were to walk into one of our hangars, we have 10 bag sets ready to go at all times. In that bag set, we have enough medication for the worst possible thing that could happen to you, every single patient. So I have a, for instance, a code cart in the hospital. I have a drug box full of code medications that are already pre-drawn up and ready to be injected. We have enough for, we, we have, we carry enough narcotics on every flight to, I don't know, sedate and treat an entire village. Um, so <laughs> we prepare for the worst because sometimes we don't know after we drop off, if we're going to go pick someone else up uh, or we don't know how long we'll be somewhere. So every single flight, we have the ability to, I don't know, intubate somebody, drop a chest tube on somebody, et cetera. We can pretty much do anything possible. Now we do offer specialty services where we have NICU teams available, or we can we have a specific NICU team that has an isolate and top of the line equipment for neonates. And we also have partnerships with um, certain groups and connections in the, you know, the rare cases where we transport ECMO patients. Uh, ECMO is something that continues to rise and What's it's a ECMO? very ECMO. So, you know, if we're gonna put them, it, if we have to put them on a serious life support, ECMO is the last resort. Uh, I don't know what ECMO yeah, is. So what I'm asking whole, you. whole different, whole different conversation. Okay. But it's it's very intensive, and it's something that you typically wouldn't put at forty thousand feet. Uh, we don't want to be bypassing the heart and filtering blood um, in an airplane. We'd rather do that in a controlled setting. Obviously. Uh, so we we have that ability to have these specialty teams also get on board of these aircrafts to transport patient, patients anywhere okay, with that. So. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of um, the training, like obviously you have your nursing degree and you're a part of this, a member of something else, but you must have, I mean, all of the per, uh, per personnel that are on these flights must have above and beyond just their standard nursing, standard paramedic. I mean, there must, what kinds of training do you guys have? Believe it or not, a lot of it is in-house training. A lot of it's onboarding. Uh, like for instance, mm -hmm. at our program, we go through a week long ground school where it's four or five days of lecture in a classroom and it's heavy on flight physiology, um, specialty care. Uh, we're not teaching you nursing basics. We're teaching you flight physiology and, and what to expect and what makes it different. Like what happens every thousand feet that we go up into the air and what that does to our organs inside, or if someone had a collapsed lung, what to expect. In terms of outside of that onboard training, um, we do have accreditations with uh, multiple institutions across the world. There's accreditations like Yurami and NAMTA. And what these guys do is they, they go around and certify and provide this accreditation that pretty much stamps that we are doing things correctly. We do have training and we do have the right training in place. We have the right uh, resources available. We have the right staff available. And these are very, very in-depth audits that happen every two years. Um, but in terms of outside, just your regular RN, uh, we have 
accreditation such as CFRN, which is a certified registered nurse or certified flight registered nurse. You have your CCRN, CEN, so certified. So there, there is some yeah. additional stuff, obviously, that you're pr providing beyond your standard um, nursing care. Right. And so we're talking about air ambulances. And I understand what you were saying about the medevacs, which is like, there's a car accident, here comes in the helicopter to take somebody to the hospital. Um, and then you also mentioned to me this commercial medical es escort, which I think um, is very interesting service and, and people are probably not utilizing it as much as they could. The way you explained it to me is, for example, and I'll use like one of my clients for an example. Um, my client has dementia, earlier stages, goes down to Florida for the winter, serious deterioration in symptoms, and now she has to come back on a commercial flight, um, but she's really confused. And, and the, on the way there, we had someone, let's say from Air Canada, escort her to the gate and she was able to fly on her own, but there's no way that that could happen on the way back. Her, her dementia has progressed too much. So that's when this um, commercial medical escort service would come into place, correct? Correct. Okay, so Simple. what what does that what does that who does that and what is the actual service? Like give me that example. You have the someone who has dementia. How does okay. that work on that end? Okay, so I have someone who has dementia uh, in, somewhere in Europe and we need we need to come back to Montreal. Uh, the patient was recently hosp just recently hospitalized, um, but has since been discharged. Um, needs to return back to Montreal. Does not have a family member or has one family member with them but they need that just slight assistance getting from point A to point B. We're 85, 90 years old, and we have just those episodes that just need a little assistance and handholding from point A to point B. That's where commercial medical escort comes into play. Uh, what, that we, what that entails is we would send, for instance, we would send a flight nurse or a flight physician, whichever, whichever we feel is necessary. This nurse or physician goes with a flight bag, very minimal amounts, we have uh, just some some simple ALS drugs, some simple things, just, just in case something were to happen. We carry an oxygen concentrator in the case that they may need oxygen up at that level. Uh, we also have an AED in the worst case scenario because not every single airplane does have what, an AED on board. So a, a, a defibrillator. Thank you, sorry, I don't uh, know. No worries, no worries. Okay. So that would be our go bag that we carry with these guys. So we would fly, they would fly me to Europe. I would kind of rendezvous with the patient, do a quick assessment, make sure that the patient is, is, in, is in good health. And I know that there really won't be any issues just getting on a commercial flight. So then I would stay with that patient and through every step of the way, I would go with them to the airport and not leave their side, help them onto the aircraft, sit next to them. And then when we land, same thing. I either take them directly to their house or to a rehab, wherever we need to get that patient to. And so would you have, Sean, in that situation, because let's let's just stay on this dementia track. Someone with dementia can have, you know, some really acute moments of uh, confusion, disorientation, um, very afraid and have some, you know, progress, I like to call them protective behaviors, which right. other people call aggression. I call it protective because they're scared. And so they're protecting themselves and there can be outbursts and things like that. Are, do you have staff that are equipped for these kinds of things as well? I mean, you're doing more than just sitting next to someone. You're right. consoling them, help. Absolutely. I mean, okay. In those situations, absolutely. What we would do is we would, in this case, we would actually vet one of our team members who does have a background, who does feel comfortable in these types of situations or previous history of working with dementia patients. We also have a network outside of our typical nurses as well that we hire across the world also specifically for this. Uh, so yeah, we, we would try to tailor this patient to the correct medical provider, someone who's not gonna, not gonna treat it as aggressive behavior and going to treat it as, as you know, protection. Yeah. And so absolutely. And we also in those cases would spend a little bit more time with the family member or that discharging physician to have a make make sure we have a thorough understanding of everything that was going on with that patient. It'd be nice to have a little bit of a medical background 
don't want to jump to pharmacology or anything like that, but were they taking anything? We need to make sure we have whatever medications that they were on, PRN, et cetera. Yeah, so exactly. we do a little bit more vetting than just show up. Yeah. So it's, yeah. And I mean, I'm not expecting you to give me actual costs because obviously it's going to, it's going to vary on, on right. all of these scenarios we're talking about. Do you have to be like a millionaire to benefit from any of these great services? Are insurances covering them? And I think you mentioned at some point, you know, sometimes it's actually more affordable than paying for the hospital when you're not in your own country. So describe to me a bit how, how people can even afford something like this. It's a great question. I, like I said, I couldn't give you prices because they vary from place to place. Um, but what I can tell you is how people do pay for them. So obviously you have your cash payers. Not everybody's a cash payer. Not everybody cash, has the cash. Advantage. Who, who so pays cash? cash. Yeah. <laughs> so, so not everybody has twenty thousand dollars just ready to swipe and, and and say, hey, I'm ready for you to come pick me up and bring me back. We do have those cases where they're an emergency and they, someone will use a credit card, but that's not our everyday client. Uh, we do work with a very large bank of assistance companies and other providers who specialize in these types of travel insurances. Ah. For instance, we all book vacations from time to time. And you'll see at the end of that booking, would you like to pay an extra, I don't know, 30 to $50 for such and such as travel assistance. And then you start to read through it and you, you under, you see that there's medical coverage and there's a, uh, you know, sometimes let's say 50 to a hundred thousand dollars in a medical emergency medevac coverage. So if you purchase that additional coverage, that would really kind of help you out. Prior to entering this industry, when I traveled, I every single time hit that deny. But what's, well, I'm oh, not going to well, need this. Yeah. I'm going on vacation. I'll be okay. And then I started flying. And then I started to fly people who didn't hit that coverage. And, um, it's, and, then, and probably people that aren't in your typical audience either. It doesn't, you don't have to be an older adult and elderly and frail to run into these situations. It could be right. you and I that come into, you know, like you said, you're on a vacation and something happens on an activity or you trip right. down the stairs at the hotel or whatever, you know? So, okay. So that's interesting. So a lot of travel insurances cover. Okay. Correct. And, yeah. and, and I believe in, you're in Montreal, you'd be able to tell me. So when you leave if you were to travel to the Caribbean, I'm, I'm pretty sure you have to carry a, um, a travel insurance, correct? Or some sort of travel coverage? You know what? We never look into it because to be honest with my husband's work insurance, it covers us whenever we're out of the country, even okay. if it's on a vacation. So he happens to have a particular insurance that gives us medical coverage. So we don't, but for emergencies, like if I you know, have an ear infection and go to the doctor right. for antibiotics, they're not going to, I don't think, cover that, but it covers emergencies. So I've never really looked into it. And I know that we never purchase anything right. additional, but now you're making me think I need to, I need to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I figured I would just ask you yeah, uh, because a lot of our, a lot of our clientele's and uh, especially during the, the months of November to May are, we're, we're taking a lot of Canadians back to Canada who are on yeah. vacation, holiday, those who come and live in South Florida for those six months who have that ability. Uh, and we do a lot, a lot of transports back to Canada. And I believe it's more affordable to actually receive care back in Canada than, than in the States. So you have, yeah, well, because it's, we're a socialized system, so it's actually included. Um, but we, we do have a, a private insurance system on top of it, like we do with my husband's work, but everybody here gets, it's actually equal. If you need right. care, you get it here in this beautiful mm -hmm. country of Canada. By the way, I'm American, so I've experienced both systems. It's okay. Um, okay. Okay. So you have travel insurance and do regular insurances cover this or no? Some Is do. It really specific? Some do. That's, okay. uh, that's uh, something that's growing. And it should grow. I, I really, it is nice to see that there is some insurance companies out there that do accept this, are willing to work and help these patients get back. Um, and then there's cases where we, maybe not the whole thing is covered. And then we'll even try to help the patient out. We'll even evaluate costs and things like that. Um, but you definitely don't have to be a millionaire. Okay. We do have high clients, high level clients that we will fly from time to time that Money is not an issue, but uh, it's not our everyday clients. But it it's funny is is that people don't think of it though. A lot of our clients are under fifty years old. Uh, we do a lot of trauma. We do a lot of accidents on cruises, things like that. Kids kids drinking and falling and having a head bleed. 
you just don't think of that. So no, no, you don't. You don't. So okay. So that's that's nice to see that there's different coverages, and so anyone could call. Like I could call directly to your number or my insurance provider could call you directly. So anyone can call you and then you'll help, I guess, navigate and ask those important yes. questions. Do you have insurance, blah, 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 and help the, the family navigate Correct. that. Okay. So yeah, so you would call, they would call into our number, whether it be you or, or insurance and our case, our CRMs, our case managers and dispatch area, we have a very huge room they'll navigate you through. They'll start asking questions. Well, do you have this type of coverage? Do you have any assistance? And let's see what we can do or who we can reach out to to help make this work if it can work. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not a door shut. If you don't have something, there's always, we're always trying to find a way. Okay, that's great. And what, just curious before we end, of course, I want you to give all the details of, of where you work and how people can find you. But before we end, pick for me, one situation that was the like hairiest for you where it was really challenging you as a professional up in the air what was the medical situation obviously respecting confidentiality and yeah, you know how you were able to manage that through one of your one of your stories there should be a movie about this job yeah, we, i joke about it all the time i said yeah. we there's all these 911 tv shows which are fantastic but an old, an amazing reality show would be yes. a, bring a cameraman with us because the medical part is cool, but it's everything that comes with it. Because when we land in these countries, we're not going to typical places everybody goes. We're on the ground and we're trusting that we're getting in the right van with the right person who's going to bring us to the right hospital. And it really is so cool and amazing what we get to experience. So it would be the ultimate reality television show, I promise. Okay, so, so let's see, let's see, Sean, if we can, you and I can come up with a production company <laughs> and make it happen. So, anyways, give me one of your hairiest situations. I'll give you two. So, I'll give you a very hairy situation, and this was the hardest thing I've ever done in my career. Uh, the hardest thing was is I went to pick up, um, I went to pick up an individual who was in the Caribbean somewhere, um, and she was 24 years old, um, and she was 23 weeks pregnant. And unfortunately she was ruptured and she was pretty much in labor and it was an interesting situation and she was already kind of sewed up and everything and we needed to transport her to the islands next to it. So wait a minute, she was in labor? As she was were... beginning, she was having her okay. contractions, I'm sorry. Okay. So she was okay. having some contractions. Well, uh, she had already okay. had a very unfortunate previous couple miscarriages. Oh, she was God. a very high risk pregnancy, very, a sweetheart. Um, so we went to pick her up because this, unfortunately, this, this island didn't have the capabilities. They did not have OB in that area. And so we picked her up and we brought her to another place in the Caribbean. Unfortunately, when we landed there, it was 11 p.m. Um, we went to drop the patient off at the hospital that was scheduled. Uh, as I'm speaking, through a, with a translator to this physician that who's going to accept her. Uh, he pretty much said, listen, if, if you give her to me, we're going to automatically abort the baby. And I kind of, I literally, I, I looked at him and I'm, I'm just like, there, you can't, we can't just say that. And, but then I realized like where we were is they could say that, I guess. Um, so patient was refusing and, you know, I, I understand I got it. So I called our dispatch and, I said, we need to, we need to go, we need to find somewhere else to go. If we go hospital to hospital on this island, that's fine. I get it's 11 PM. I get the airport's closing. Uh, so we went, it took us probably two or three different hospitals to find the right person uh, who was going to at least give this woman a fighting chance, at least uh, assess the baby. And um, it wasn't that it was a, you know, a very difficult nursing challenge for me because there really wasn't much for me to do, but it was really just kind of, situational awareness thing like i am not gonna i was supposed to help her get to the right place and right now i'm taking to her i'm taking her to a lower level of care in the sense that that physician's going to give her no chance so after three hospitals we finally found a very nice woman who was willing to give her a chance treated her very well uh assessed her admitted her and i'm not sure what happens with the with the baby if it happens or if she was able to save the child but that sense of hope that she gave the patient was really what was the best part. So that was very challenging. Yeah, and you know, Sean, that's such a beautiful story and you gave sense of hope too. And this is where 
your skills are so beyond nursing because if you said that nursing wise you didn't have to do much right there you were you know a detective looking right. into where you were going to go you had to think about your own like nurse nursing code of ethics and what does it mean to agree to a physician to aborting the baby so now you have all your professional codes whirling around in your mind and then you were like the role of psychologist probably yeah. just supporting her and keeping her yeah. calm and hopeful and Oh, wow. It's too bad you don't know what happened in that situation. No, that would drive me crazy to drop someone off and not know. Oh, that would yeah, drive me crazy. Very, very wild situation. Um, but it, it's really hard to stay calm because I'm in a foreign country. I'm in an island. I, I don't speak the language and I don't know any of the hospitals there. And I'm acting like I know what we're doing. And I'm acting like this hospital is <laughs> this and that. And you just, it's that sense of hope. It'll do a lot. Yeah. And, and what's I the do, other situation? So the other situation just so happens to be in that same island. <laughs> I, it's like, for me, it's a black cloud. I see the island on my, I don't, I can't go there. Um, we were transporting an individual who did have a collapsed lung um, and he was intubated for multiple days. Um, we ended up transferring him into our, the ambulance. Uh, however, the ambulance ride in that country was very rocky. Uh, it was like riding through pothole after pothole and we're doing about 60 miles an hour with the patient jumping all over in the back on the stretcher with a tube and a chest tube here. Um, we noticed as we got to the airport, it was pitch black and we're getting rushed because they want to shut the airport down because it's 10 PM. They don't have lights, et cetera. And it's monsoon rain. And I need to get this patient out of the ambulance into the, <laughs> the stretcher on the airplane. Uh, so we're doing our best to move as fast as possible. Well, at some point in the pitch black, because we had no lights, no batteries in the airplane, because we were not provided uh, a ground unit to provide power um, because they were closed. Uh, it was pitch black and unfortunately a cord was actually caught, got caught when the patient was being transported into the air ambulance. So when we got in there, we noticed that the end title or the oxygen level wasn't reading on the monitor anymore and it was kind of oh crap and it's like maybe something's unplugged and then we finally show our flashlight onto the patient and i see bile blood all kinds of gastric content in the endotracheal tube and i'm like uh oh so we pretty much didn't have an airway on a patient who needed an airway and was oh on the God. ventilator pitch black no battery so we're doing this in the dark in a tight space and we um for about 30 minutes it took us really took us about 30 minutes to obtain a new airway on this patient because it was that dark and oh he was God. very obese, had a very short neck, difficult intubation. He did great. The family member sat next to me the whole time as we're in the dark trying to put a new tube down their throat and um, actually delivered the patient more stable than he was when we picked up. Um, better Amazing. Apart. Yeah. So it was just, uh, it was a sense, it was an event where we had to act calm and the pressure was even higher because the wife was sitting right next to me. <laughs> she spoke Spanish only. I didn't speak oh a lick of Spanish. Save him! Um, save him! <laughs> actually, she was she was very calm. And because a couple times I had my partner say, "Hey, can you just tell her what's going on?" And she kept telling us in Spanish that, "Hey, listen, I have full faith in you guys. Oh. I don't want to intervene. You got this." But you speak um, Spanish now, I guess, huh? After working uh, in that hospital? You know what? I understand a little bit. My wife speaks, my wife is Colombian. And the fact that uh, I don't speak Spanish is really, uh, it's embarrassing. Yeah. Uh, but now that I graduated <laughs> school, I think maybe I have a little bit of time to yeah. do that. So uh, we have one comment before we end. I just want to mention Angelique said, uh, first, she's glad to learn of the service. She wants to mention two things. Number one, even if you purchase the special option, it will not apply if your health condition is part of the exclusions on your policy. Number two, all travel insurance has a medical coordinator free of charge integrated into every travel insurance policy. She's mentioning it and recommends it, be, especially for seniors, is to give, to, to get that and to give a copy of this to a family or friend before you leave. So thank Absolutely. you, Angelique, for uh, mentioning that. Sean, it's been so great to learn about this. You've really opened my eyes and now my like media side is spinning on how we can make this a series. I mean, this is so amazing to me, um, what you do and it should, we should highlight this and have this out there to show what people are doing. Um, how do people get a hold of you and the company Reva? What's the best way? So the best way to get a hold of Reva is, is simple. It's www.flyreva.com. 
R-E-V-A. R-E-V-A, just like on my shirt here. Uh, and right there, you can't miss it. There's a how to contact us. There's a phone number. And we are staffed 24-7, 365. Uh, there's dispatch, case managers, medical coverage, medical director, always available no matter what. Uh, we don't stop. And uh, that's the easiest way to get a hold of us. And uh, I think you pretty much touched on everything. And the media side should be spinning because um, <laughs> during COVID, we've done a lot of stuff like that. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were part of the cruise ship that was stuck in South America. Oh, wow. And no one would accept them. And actually, we were the ones who transported that group of, I forget, 20 plus individuals who were positive with COVID back to all their home countries, including Canada, uh, when nobody would move them or nobody would accept them in that country. So we get to do some amazing things. So I really appreciate you bringing me on here and kind of spreading the word. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, thanks again for everybody for watching. Uh, I'm going to end the broadcast now, Sean, but hang on for a second so we can chat. Gotcha. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.